My name is Stephen Hull, trademark and entertainment law expert, who will provide us with an overview of parliamentary deliberations on the Copyright Bill and provide us with some insights on how licensing and commercial dealings on copyright matters will be affected if the bill is enacted in its current form. Stephen, over to you. Thank you so much, Robin. Uh, thank you for inviting me today to participate. Thank you also to Michelle Maguire for inviting me uh, today. And I must say, Michelle and Robin, I've, uh, I've, I actually was surprised to see that you uh, allocated 45 minutes to me, especially after Michelle was at the copyright conference uh, that uh, that I sort of arranged in Joburg last year. You'll remember that one went on for, I think, five hours. Because that's uh, that's what it takes when you want to discuss all of the issues uh, with this copyright amendment bill. Uh, the purpose of today is really to uh, have a discussion. Uh, it's not going to be a formal presentation. Uh, uh, what I'll do is is inform you of uh, uh, current developments and important developments and opportunities. And also, since we're a group of lawyers, to uh, to provide you with some input that you can share with your with your clients, uh, and um, and we can we can also then look at some of the provisions in this bill that um, that are not affected by the president's referral uh, decision. Uh, so it may not it may not actually have constitutional bearing because unfortunately. Uh, we, you know, there's no law against making bad law, as they say, um, but it will have a, a very, uh, a tremendous impact on trade uh, in in South Africa, the way that you can do business uh, in our creative sectors. And, you know, whenever I speak about this topic, I can't help but uh, become quite passionate about it, because this is not just a legal matter. It's not just a, a business matter. It's a, it's indeed a matter that affects all of us uh, as South Africans, because this bill has the power to uh, really drive investment into our creative sectors, and our creative sectors has the power to actually reinvigorate this uh, this economy of ours uh, at a time when we when we really need it most, as we all know. So uh, one has to look at uh, uh, the discussion on the Copyright Amendment Bill in that context. It's not just a discussion on, uh, you know, what's currently on paper, but it's how would the how would those proposals, those the legislative text, translate to uh, to business decisions? Does it actually create an enabling environment for especially international companies that are interested in doing uh, uh, in investing in South Africa uh, and also local companies who create uh, uh, employment opportunities uh, for, uh, you know, for creators here? So I feel almost like a, like addressing you all as my, you know, as my colleagues, first and foremost, uh, and secondly, as concerned citizens of South Africa, uh, it's time that we actually all, uh, uh, you know, become quite active um, and and that we make sure that our clients who are commercially active in this space understand what the risks are to them in, in if this bill is enacted in its uh, present form and what can still be done to make sure that, um, you know, that, uh, uh, that disaster is averted as far as possible. Uh, the unfortunate reality with this bill is that, uh, as I've mentioned, not all of the the the, the hugely concerning provisions are have constitutional implications. And and where we are at the moment, as you know, uh, the the president has referred the bill back to parliament. Now that happened in, uh, around uh, April this year, and. Um, on that note, it's it's quite. Uh, if one pauses to think about that referral notice, it's quite significant because the president actually referred a bill back that was unanimously approved by his parliament at a time when, uh, politically speaking, it, it's it's not the best time, I guess, uh, to to go up against a unanimous decision by your party. So. It's a. It was a monumentous decision. I think a brave decision from uh, from President Ramaphosa to refer the bill back, and 
one has to wonder, you know, was it really a surprise that the bill was was sent back uh, by the president? Um, those those uh, lawyers who've been working the case closely and those businesses who've been involved in lobbying the president's office and informing of the of the uh, you know the economic dangers that this bill poses um, weren't too surprised by the president's referral notice and and we'll go into that in a in a little bit why but uh, it was quite obvious from the get go this was one of the most controversial. Uh, legislative proposals that sailed through Parliament in almost record time, uh, and uh, and and one also needs to wonder why that happened, uh, because right from the get-go, stakeholders, local stakeholders, were up in arms. We saw uh, uh, musicians, uh, the very vulnerable artists that the bill was purported to uh, to protect. Uh, march on Parliament, forming a trade union and marching a couple of times in Cape Town on Parliament uh, to uh, to actually voice their concerns because what's happened is uh, uh, if one sort of turns back the clock uh, around 2009, one of the major catalysts of the copyright reform project was actually a group of musicians that went to uh, the office of uh, former President Zuma uh, and said, look, it's been, uh, Mr. President, we need your help. Uh, you know, it's been uh, almost uh, a decade since the reintroduction of needle time royalties for musicians uh, in South Africa. And yet we we actually can't see uh, uh, any payments coming in from, from uh, uh, you know, for these usages of, of our works. And that led to, uh, as many of you will know, the establishment of a commissioned inquiry, the CRC uh, report, Copyright Review Commission, that contained many valuable suggestions uh, and recommendations that were focused on uplifting the uh, the plight uh, of our vulnerable creatives, especially in the music industry. So it's quite profound, if you think about it, that the very of uh, uh, start of the focus of honorable creatives, that it was the very same creatives, especially the musicians, who then almost a decade later, uh, after the DTI has gone through this process of doing their research uh, um, and actually coming up with, with a bill and a legislative text, that the very people that they say it's, it's protecting are actually marching on the office uh, of uh, on, on parliament building and saying, uh, you know, please don't go ahead with this bill. Um, so, so clearly somewhere along the line, there was a shift of focus. Uh, the DTI actually confirmed that about a week or so before the August 2017 parliamentary hearings, the first uh, public hearings on the bill, uh, when they announced that uh, they've been, they've decided to transform our law into uh, a user access oriented system. Now, there wasn't really an underlying policy uh, uh, statement or uh, or any impact assessment to support this uh, really dramatic U-turn from number one, focusing on increasing rights for uh, for vulnerable creatives and performers, and on the other hand, deciding we actually need to look at the uh, the rights of access that people demand uh, nowadays in a uh, especially in a developing country. Now, these are all very difficult, uh, uh, you know, and challenging topics uh, that one needs to uh, to approach very carefully. One one good place to have started was to conduct appropriate impact assessments to make sure uh, how these quite radical proposals that uh, governments uh, uh, included in the bill would actually impact on trade and investment uh, and in each of these sectors that uh, are affected. One of the major problems with the bill is that it, it, it tends to, uh, uh, you know, ignore the fact that there's more than one industry. Uh, it's, it, it, it doesn't have a nuanced approach. And a lot of, of, of government's utterances on the bills have actually indicated that there was a misunderstanding that, yes, the Copyright Act is very old uh, uh, and it needs to be updating. Everyone is on board. Everyone agrees with that. But the way that works have uh, are created now differs significantly from the way that copyright protected works were were created in 1978. So you can't, when you legislate on uh, on let's say updating the law, 
still bring up the old examples of, let's say, Solomon Linda, who on his own did a, did a deal that, that wasn't good for him. We must look at ways of restitution to make sure that doesn't happen again. Now, that's fair enough. Uh, you can have a, a certain safeguard against that, but that can't be your broad approach. The reason I say that is nowadays uh, copyright protected, uh, copyright works, especially of uh, uh, copyright works where there's high financial investment are not created by one person sitting in a uh, in a study or sitting outside against uh, you know dreaming and 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 coming up with with a, with a poem or something like or, or or a new song it's actually created by teams of people so the especially the high investment yield uh, projects we're thinking feature film we're thinking music of uh, music works we're thinking music videos uh, software development etc animation uh, you'd be astounded if you have, uh, you know, if you look up how many people are involved in a song. Uh, as a copyright lawyer in the music business, I've, 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 I've actually found instances where, and that's become the norm, if somebody infringes on your client's song, allegedly, and you look up uh, who the owners are, uh, you know, who created the lyrics and the composition, uh, you'd, you'd likely find on, on successful uh, uh, songs that there could be 12 people who wrote the lyrics and 12 people who wrote the uh, uh, who, uh, who composed this the music and different producers involved so when you look at the at the updating of the copyright act uh, and you actually base most of what you're trying to achieve on rectifying the wrongs of the past when the when copyright protected works were created in a, in a much different way than today you're going to run into problems and that's one of the the very key issues uh, that those who were involved in the uh, the first parliamentary hearings on the bills back in 2017, it was very clear to see there was a complete lack of understanding on government's part that there are so many different industries and each one of them have their own rights models. Each one of them have their own uh, uh, contractual uh, needs, uh, you know, to trade not only in South Africa but also uh, internationally, globally. And now that we're entering into uh, the, the, the um, let's call it the digital age, we've already, we're already there, but South Africa's act is, uh, that was the other catalyst, right? It wasn't only to uplift the plight of, uh, of our, our creatives, but it was also stated policy objectives that, uh, ob objective that government wanted to uh, uplift, our, uh, uh, or not uplift, modernize our copyright, uh, our copyright regime. So that South Africa, to meet the challenges and also the opportunities that that uh, that the digital era brings and that global digital trade brings, and as we're going to, as I'm going to uh, to show you, you know, unfortunately, these two uh, highly valuable um, uh, areas for government to work on with respect to the law uh, were, um, were were just uh, un unsatisfied. It fell flat on its face, um, and. And we are actually at a, at a position where uh, what's happened with the with a shift away from uh, 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 you know towards more free access, more uh, copyright exceptions and limitations, the introduction of uh, of the U.S. styled fair use system, but without any of the safeguards, without any enforcement, new enforcement mechanisms as they have in the United States, for instance, in statutory damages, to somehow balance the scales. What we have in South Africa is a weakening of the copyrights regime here to an all-time and worldwide low. And the people who uh, are looking forward to that are the ones who want to make more free use, unremunerated uses. Um, uh, and these include governments, they include uh, uh, tech companies who, who build very successful businesses on the basis of uh, unremunerated usages or, or unfairly remunerated usages as well of copyright protected works over the years since the dawn of the digital age shaping the the rules in their in their favor and that's why we see in the rest of the world and also quite recently interestingly while south africa was was uh, grappling with updating its laws uh, we saw in the in the eu there was a move to by lawmakers to say look we've got to stop this growing value gap how do we do that uh, we've got uh, internet platforms that are actually um you know, have user bases spanning billions of people clicking and accessing music and film and and uh, and publications, and they're actually not paying for it. The users aren't paying for it. So what that means is that you've got billions of people who click for free, listen to free, consume for free, and then don't go out to the stores like they used to in the past and buy the product. 
uh, leading to the value gap, which the tech companies will tell you doesn't exist, but I can assure you it does. So in, e in the EU, uh, actually a jurisdiction, as we all know, that we do share common law with, there was a clear move uh, towards um, uh, more regulation of, of tech companies and to say, look, you're going to, uh, have, uh, and I think this was proposed in 2018 when our bills were not yet uh, finalized, uh, the, the uh, controversial somewhat um, provisions, Article 13 and 17 of the, uh, of the European Directive for the Digital Market, um, that said, we're going to place some more obligations uh, on uh, internet platforms to, to take responsibility for the content that is proliferated on their, con on, on their platforms, and also, they must uh, pay uh, royalties or market-related royalties to uh, for for usages and and make sure licenses are in place. While that was happening, South Africa decided to South Africa's government decided to run in the opposite direction and to to legislate for a regime that allows for unbridled uh, uh, free and open access. It in some areas legitimizes copyright theft. Uh, 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 for instance, here I'm speaking directly to. Uh, the uh, proposal in, in, in Section 19D uh, to, for governments and educational institutions in the publishing space to, if they disagree on price with the author or the publisher of a book in the, in the educational space, they can just freely copy and distribute the book as they want and cut the author off from their, uh, from their uh, uh, you know, money stream. Now, the problem in South Africa, being a developing country, uh, is... Most of our authors who write for a living write in the educational space. So if you are going to legislate that government can actually drive prices down as they wish for the sake of education, um, now we've got a problem because government on the one hand is saying to, to creators, this bill is going to really enhance your rights. But on the other hand, they're cutting off most authors who write for a living in South Africa in such a harsh and, and obvious way. So that's just one of the examples where there's a clear uh, problem insofar as arbitrary uh, deprivation of, 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 of intellectual property rights is concerned, which is a clear constitutional issue. And, uh, and that's why this bill ended up in hot water. Um, now, one wonders, you know, with the DTI taking 10 years to process this bill um, and develop the bill, why did it come to a point that there's so much unhappiness? And that's exactly what the president said. And that's why the president... After the bills sailed to time for the purpose, uh, I presume, to have the bills enacted before the, the general elections in May because it contained a lot of uh, empty promises for, uh, for the very uh, creators that we're speaking about that they, they should vote because they're going to get increased rights. Um, but the president realized there's such a groundswell of opposition from the very creators. I mean, why is he receiving his office receiving petitions from our most famous authors? We've got Wilbur Smith and, and, uh, and, and Archbishop Desmond Tutu and uh, Dion Mayer and Ethel Fugard writing to the president saying, please don't sign this bill. We've got musicians marching on, on Parliament, quite fascinating uh, developments, um, and you've got stakeholders locally organizing and internationally organizing and going to their governments and saying uh, in the EU and America, uh, look, we feel if this bill goes through, we're going to lose a legitimate market in South Africa to trade in because our intellectual property protections will be so low in the copyright industries that we won't be able to recover our investments. And as I mentioned uh, before, uh, the, the, the copyright space has changed and the way that works are created has changed and the way money is spent and invested into the creation of high quality content has changed dramatically. So when you are wanting to seek uh, to invite investment into South Africa's copyright industries, we're talking now about substantial significant investment. At some point, government has to uh, move the ideological arguments aside of uh, some academics and anti-copyright uh, uh, professors who say copyright is there to restrict access, we must have free access for all, we must have more, uh, especially in the name of education, everything must be free. Um, and think and ask, who are the people who employ uh, people in this field? Who are the people who actually the businesses that invest uh, in South Africa's markets? Who are the people who actually uh, how do we invite that investment and have those discussions? At this point in time, uh, we 
we actually can't afford to be experimenting with ideological uh, 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 issues like that. And that is why President Ramaphosa realized there's a serious problem here. And he even called an extraordinary meeting between uh, the departments of uh, the DTI at the time and also the DIC. And he asked Minister Natim Tetwa and uh, former Minister Davies, uh, what is going on? You know, can you call some stakeholder engagements and uh, and and have a meeting and find out what the what industry is so upset about? Uh, why is the United States actually uh, the USTR, the office of the US uh, trade representative, investigating South Africa for um, to see whether we'll be in breach of OCOA and we might risk losing uh, our GSP preferential tax uh, benefits, uh, you know, if we if I enact this bill. W what's going on? Didn't you do your due process? And that was quite extraordinary in itself because um, uh, I'm not aware of a similar meeting like that where a bill has already gone through to the to the president and the president actually said, you guys need to come up with something here uh, to inform me. And uh, they had that meeting, uh, it, nothing really, uh, it, it, uh, you know, I think developed from there. And the president realized that uh, stakeholders' concerns, as were communicated to him by submissions, uh, uh, some some uh, legal opinions from some of our top constitutional uh, heavyweight lawyers, in, including uh, 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 senior counsel Stephen Butlander, uh, informing the president that, um, that uh, there's constitutional issues. Now, of course, even before this happened and while the bill was, uh, was being uh, uh, deliberated on in parliament before a vote was taken on the bill, uh, the parliament, uh, the National Assembly appointed four experts Three of them local, uh, uh, and and some of our colleagues. Uh, you'll you'll know Andre Myberg. Andre might even be on the call here. I can't see everyone, but I hope he is because I want to ask him a question uh, to illuminate to you. But um, Andre Myberg uh, at Wiseman Gubo is who's a who's a expert in the in the music business. Uh, understands digital licensing and 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 rights management organisations and how they work and 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 operate uh, better than anyone. And then also uh, uh, Joel Baloy, who's uh, who who's uh, 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 incredible, uh, um, knowledgeable on copyright, and uh, is a professor at UNISA at present. Um, and then we had the fourth expert was Michelle Woods uh, of WIPO in in Geneva, senior director in copyright. All four experts uh, informed wrote hundreds of pages uh, of very valuable recommendations before. The these bills face as constitutional and also um, uh, issues relating to breaches of international treaties. Uh, one of the experts, Joel Baloy, even pointed out that um, due to the, the, the principle of national treatment uh, uh, in terms of the Berne Convention, if the bill were to be uh, enacted as, as, as it was worded, that um, it would actually lead to potentially to a situation where South Africa's creatives would be worse off in South Africa than foreign creators would be here. The reason being the Berne Convention says that there's these minimum standards, and if you as a country decide to uh, legislate at a lower level than that, uh, then that uh, will apply to your people only and not to uh, to their counterparts in other Berne member countries because there is that minimum threshold that you will have to respect. So quite astonishingly, this uh, legislation, which was held out to to really be the savior for our, our vulnerable creative communities, indigenous communities and creators, uh, has actually had implications that the experts, the guys who know, uh, who were appointed by the National Assembly to advise them on the bills, uh, informing that unless certain substantial additional work is done, uh, these bills will not pass constitutional muster and they will place us in breach of international treaties, and it will likely lead to uh, significant disinvestment into our creative uh, sectors. Now, uh, despite the warnings from, from the experts, uh, the bills went through, they sailed through, like I mentioned, in record time. I think the bills were approved by the National Assembly uh, for, uh, 4 or 5 December 2018, rushed through to the NCOP uh, that, that deliberated on it in February of, of uh, 2019, and then um, actually uh, before the May uh, elections, as it was um, as it was deemed important for for these bills to be enacted, it was it was presented to the uh, NCOP, 
And the DTI said, don't worry, we've got it all in hand. We've looked at everything. Uh, and uh, the four experts that, that were appointed by the National Assembly all basically gave the green light to the bills. They're good to go. Now, uh, one of the experts was luckily in the room, uh, Andre Myberg, and uh, he, he uh, informed the other experts. And this led to a letter sent to the minister, Rob Davies at the time, and also the uh, the chair of the select committee of the NCOP to say that was inaccurate. Uh, we all raised serious concerns uh, with the bills. Yes, copies of our advices. Uh, please let us know if you want an engagement. Uh, what followed was uh, uh, well, it was it was quite astonishing. Uh, the bills were at the next meeting. Um, they voted on the bill, and they just, uh, despite this this uh, alarming uh, uh, alarming uh, uh, let's call it uh, objection, it was um, it was uh, sent through. So now we are at a, at a position where the bill is actually uh, uh, in front of uh, well referred back by the president on the basis of some constitutional concerns. And uh, there's two very important things that I want to mention to you. I, 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 I mentioned that Michelle was ambitious to only give me four or five minutes. I see we're already sailing along, and I've got a lot more to tell you. So uh, I think let me tell you the most important bits uh, first, uh, and then um, at least then everyone who's joined the meeting will have gotten the, uh, let's call it the bull point. I think the most important thing is that uh, the pre we must understand there's two, uh, there's, there's two issues issues here. Number one, uh, even though the president identified uh, six uh, uh, areas of constitutional concern that he has reservations about and that he wants the uh, the National Assembly to the Portfolio Committee on Trade and Industry to um, to to actually look at and and, uh, you know, to, to see whether these reservations, of, you know, may have constitutional implications as, as he believes. The most important one is the issue of retagging. Now, the tagging issue, uh, uh, you know, in brief, bills are in terms of the constitution process, in terms of a Section 75 bill. Such bills uh, uh, actually don't uh, in involve, include the uh, the participation of the provinces. Uh, and then Section 76 bills, which affect, ma affect matters of trade and industry and also cultural matters. Now, those bills have to. Uh, include the uh, uh, have the involvement of the of the provinces, and um, the copyright amendment bill was uh, for some bizarre reason uh, actually processed in terms of a section 75 process. I say bizarre because uh, a bill, be, uh, you know, if you want to make an argument to say that the that the copyright bill does not affect matters of trade or culture, um, uh, then we can have a long. Um, secondly, there's precedent. There's legal precedent for this. Uh, the the intellect, the IPLAB, the Intellectual Property Laws Amendment Bill, which also purports to uh, uh, amend the Copyright Act, uh, was first processed by uh, in terms of Section 75. And um, President Zuma, former President Zuma, took uh, legal advice on the matter, uh, which uh, from uh, and had a, a, a an excellent opinion from um, uh, Senior Counsel Gilbert Marcus. Uh, that confirmed that this bill should be processed in terms of uh, Section uh, 76. So the bill was referred back, uh, I think it was 20, 2016, uh, don't quote me on that one, but the bill was referred back. And um, and at that point in time, uh, you know, the if you think about it, the, the current uh, bill, uh, that bill also needed to be discussed by the, uh, before the House of Traditional Leaders. It probably took a year to go through the provinces, and whether you like the, the, the IPLAB uh, or not, it became an act. And um, and the existing Copyright Act actually purports to amend that act uh, through, uh, not directly, but indirectly through uh, the introduction of uh, new exceptions and limitations to rights, uh, which will affect the indigenous communities and how they can trade with their, with their uh, cultural works. And also the so-called contract override provision, which I'll mention again shortly, uh, that basically says um, that any right afforded to you in terms of the Copyright Act, uh, you can't waive it even if you wanted to. Now, um, on that note, uh, I think it's important to know that the, the National Assembly has started deliberations, uh, of, uh, the, the Portfolio Committee has started deliberations on the bill. Um, they were they received presentations from the DTI uh, and the minister, uh, well, the new minister Patel, uh, who informed that there's uh, and the parliamentary advisor who was involved previously, 
uh, Charmaine van der Merwe, who all informed uh, that there's there's really nothing wrong with the bills, um, and uh, but they'll they they think it's better to earn a side of caution, um, and that the committee should well heed uh, some of the concerns, um, especially the tagging issue. So. The, the portfolio committee has resolved to uh, to actually retag this bill and to uh, allow it to go through the uh, the parliamentary process for a section 76 bill the, the decision has not been confirmed by the national assembly as of yet but it it will be a strange u turn and and i think there'll be a lot of opposition to them uh, changing their mind on this and there's a significant opportunity that exists for uh, all the lawyers in the room today uh, to uh, re-engage with your clients uh, who are engaged in the copyright industries and to inform that there's a real prospect uh, that uh, in the coming months um, or once this decision is notified that the bill will be returned uh, uh, basically re-tagged and the it will need to be sent to the to the to the provinces to the provincial governments uh, for for consultation and uh, and and their inputs, and they might very well call for stakeholder engagement. Um, now, uh, some of the provincial governments where you have, um, you know, a strong commercial, uh, let's say, commercial centres like Gauteng, uh, Western Cape, and uh, KZN, where especially um, copyright works um, are, uh, you know, the trading and copyright works. Think about feature film production in the Western Cape and elsewhere. Uh, these are important topics. So th there's definitely going to be another uh, uh, opportunity for uh, for engagement if in, in front of the provincial governments uh, with respect to all aspects of the bill, not just the reservations raised by the president. At the moment, the portfolio committee is limited to, uh, their scope is limited to only those reservations raised by the president. Um, uh, the president's reservations work, some of them were quite broad, uh, if you think about it. So apart from the section, uh, the parliamentary process, that was an issue. Uh, he's also raised the uh, quite a broad uh, of, of reservation that many of the provisions would not uh, uh, meet with, uh, uh, would, be, would, play, would potentially place South Africa in breach of important international treaties. Uh, and um, on that point, if, uh, if you read the advice from uh, Andre Mayberg, one of the experts that I mentioned, he focuses a lot of his attention on that point. His advice is 200 pages long, and, uh, and that tells you that, that, that there's more than one uh, problem in that sense. Um, then you've also got uh, issues where the president felt that there's uh, potentially, uh, uh, you know, arbitrary deprivations of property. Uh, we, we know from the bill that uh, government um, feels that it's uh, it's actually entitled a good idea to um, to actually legislate for statutory royalties, compulsory, unwaivable royalties at every actor that's ever acted in a in a in a film production or a music video or a uh, any audiovisual production in South Africa should now get paid for past and future works. Um, also, people who uh, authored visual artistic works uh, should should have a compulsory, unwaivable right to share in royalties. Uh, it's quite astonishing if you think on on visual artistic works that if you're a designer uh, of a, a graphic designer of a brand, uh, you you actually can now maybe look forward to contacting the brand for which you uh, you designed the logo because it says notwithstanding the assignment of copyright, you, you can share in, in 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 royalties received for license usages of that work from the owner. Uh, quite astonishing uh, that these provisions managed to to uh, withstand the the, the um, you know the vehement opposition uh, from lawyers uh, and from stakeholders during the consultation phases. Um, so. Uh, so the president's reservations uh, uh, side, the, uh, I think that's the, the very important point for the lawyers in the room to get is that uh, I think it's time to reevaluate with your clients if, you, uh, if there's an opportunity to do so, to say that we will have uh, likely an opportunity to re-engage um, the, uh, the provincial governments on, on all aspects uh, of the bill. Um, and there's a valuable opportunity there. Uh, for um, you know, for for hopefully substantial uh, amendments to be made, uh, I'm going to uh, just sort of swiftly move on to um, to also inform you on some of the other issues. So we must also bear in mind now that even though the president has identified these uh, these six areas that he mentioned in his referral notice, by no means does that mean the president got all of them. Uh, and I'm, and and uh, I know of one. 
uh, offhand, uh, Section uh, 8A, the, the statutory, uh, new statutory royalty for performance on audiovisual works, it wasn't open for public comment. So that's, that's, that is also a constitutional issue in the same way as the President's reservation that, um, that the Section 12A extension of the fair use uh, proposal was not uh, properly consulted on. And that wasn't mentioned in the President's uh, referral notice. So that shows that even though the President's referral, uh, the President uh, mentioned and identified a number of very uh, key and serious uh, provisions in the bill uh, that have a constitutional bearing and, and, and uh, give rise to concern, it wasn't uh, it wasn't uh, exclusive. So if the DTI from its presentations that we've witnessed so far believe that if they address these six issues as outlined in the president's uh, referral notice, they will they will wipe out all the uh, constitutional issues or areas of concern. They, they're mistaken. Um, and there's also broader issues. Now, the, the other uh, sections that will be of particular interest to um, I think to the group at LES, uh, which affect licensing and 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 also, uh, you know, how you can deal with with copyright protected works in a in a commercial and a business way in South Africa uh, if the bill comes in. Um, these provisions don't all. Uh, these provisions actually don't all. Sorry, I see I'm sort of getting some uh, some sun here in our office. Maybe I can move in a way that that's a little bit more friendly to uh, the viewers. Um, Maybe that's a bit better. So, um, so even though we actually in a in a position of that, of uh, you know, we have to. There's there's actually no. Unfortunately, there's no uh, there's no law against making passing bad law. So we've we've got a lot of provisions that um, that if you. Sorry, I'm not actually getting getting right moving from this. So you'll, we'll just have to uh, continue. I see we we're already moving close on time. So um, let's go there. So basically, there's provisions included in the bill that may not have constitutional bearing, but it will have uh, quite a significant bearing on how on whether people will want to do business in South Africa. So to give you uh, an example of a, of a couple of important ones, um, and I think when one considers these provisions, you, you must always you must you must always consider the business aspect, and I think that's where the drafters of the bill fell short. Uh, uh, to their, you know, unfortunately, they didn't have appropriate impact, economic impact assessments that that they could rely on to prepare uh, uh, to under, to fully appreciate what they're legislating. So, uh, when when one looks at how business is done in the creative industries, uh, what investors, especially high-level projects, uh, are looking for. Um, I would say would be legal certainty. Uh, investors want to know a plan of financial uh, layout for this big project. Think of a feature film, think of commercials, animation, uh, software development. Uh, these projects are projects that uh, if we have an enabling legislative environment, we could in a couple of months have a number of feature films being shot on location in South Africa that will actually potentially create thousands of jobs instantly uh, and it's it's quite fascinating, you know, the cost of these uh, high-level productions. I mean, a feature film can cost a uh, hundred million dollars uh, to produce, and um, and they estimate that around 60% of your production budget gets spent in the first quarter of your production time. So that's a significant investment into the local sector because. Uh, arrangements have to be made to make sure that the catering companies are on set, to make sure that the sets are built, to make sure that there's accommodation, hotels, car rental, uh, uh, plane tickets, uh, uh, the local coffee shop on the corner uh, is full every day. It, the satellite economy, the knock-on effect to the economy is significant. It's not only the, that film production, right? So, uh, but what what you need uh, from as as an investor uh, is legal certainty uh, number one that you can actually recoup your costs uh, and number two uh, i would say that you need to be able to unify your the rights in the project so that you can uh, uh, own the rights or license the rights out um, uh, but the, but without a unification of rights uh, it's it's a non-starter really um, especially on high high risk financial uh, investments and then you also have to have uh, proper enforcement mechanisms, especially in digital trade. 
of, uh, and especially in a continent like Africa, where it's a problem all around the world. But I think we know we've got a big problem to deal with because we don't have app, we, we we don't actually have effective enforcement mechanisms to deal with uh, rampant piracy and also with uh, with issues like um, anti counterfeit trading online. Um, huge opportunities were missed, uh, uh, you know, on all of these fronts, unfortunately, because uh, what the bill does is it makes it incredibly, it makes it impossible really to unify rights, number one. Uh, it limits the assignment of, um, of literary and, 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 uh, and musical works to 25 years maximum. And, it, and the bill contains this, uh, this quite uh, unique worldwide, uh, I don't think it exists anywhere else, uh, provision, uh, the contract override provision that I mentioned earlier that says um, even if you, you know, if you are a beneficiary of a right in terms of the act, uh, you are not going to be able to um, to waive that right. So government tried to, uh, to, to help the artists who in the past uh, have done a bad deal. And like I mentioned earlier, the mention of, uh, of you know, the lone artists um, Solomon, Linda, etc. Not recognizing that now we're dealing with multi-authored works. We're dealing with multi-authored works on a scale that we've never dealt with before. And if you limit assignments uh, and you you can't contract out of it, what that means is that if I'm a a, a movie studio, uh, locally or internationally, I, I probably won't uh, engage you to as a composer to compose the theme song for. Uh, the Black Panther sequel, and I probably won't engage the services of a, a, a scriptwriter in South Africa because uh, after 25 years, I lose uh, the right to actually, uh, um, you know, use that work. I might have to withdraw my product from the market uh, when half of the copy, copyright term has been satisfied, uh, uh, which is a third of the copyright term in America. So you can understand why American uh, businesses are very upset about a lot of the proposals. Um, then you've also got, with respect to unification of rights, uh, quite a crazy provision in the sister bill, the sister bill to the uh, Copyright Act, uh, the Performance Bill, that says after 25 years, uh, every single actor that featured on that uh, on that film that basically made a sound uh, in the film uh, will uh, f uh, will receive the exclusive rights to further commercialize the work from there. And if the movie studio wants to continue to uh, to to commercialize the film, they'll have to do a deal with every every single actor uh, who featured on there and who 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 had some sound recording added to the audiovisual work. So. Some of the intentions are good, I'm sure, uh, but the uh, but the bill actually uh, goes so far that it makes it uh, it makes it a, a situation where uh, when people assess the risk of bringing a project here, even local companies, uh, a local production company or local uh, company making music videos, will have to think uh, maybe we should set up an office in Mauritius. Where we've got some texts, uh, and we can also make sure that we can unify rights in our projects. And believe me, if local companies think that, and I know that I do because I speak to them, uh, international companies think so too. And the the it, it sounds horrible when I say this, but um, the during COVID, it it was actually a, a horrendous time for our creative sectors. But it was also an indication of what our creative sectors would look like if there's major disinvestment and no projects uh, being brought to South Africa. And if you if you think about these kind of provisions, and also um, there's actually many more, we just don't have a, a time to delve into all of them, uh, but there's a new, uh, for instance, um, the administration uh, that it will take to make sure you're compliant. Every single production company, whether you do commercials, films, television, uh, music, We'll probably have to establish its own legal, a new legal team, and also an administration department of sorts to make sure that you that you uh, uh, make sure that you record all of these people who who appeared in your production. You keep a record of them so that they can get paid royalties even before you get a net profit. It doesn't have to. It doesn't matter if you commercialize. You have to pay. And uh, we don't know what these royalties are. We don't know um, how it will be calculated. Uh, DTI was so unsure that they actually legislated for the minister after the bill will go will be signed in after the general elections because they did, ran out of time for the minister to actually go away and to conduct his own impact assessment. Have you ever heard of something like that? So what if the minister uh, goes away and determines through impact assessment that it's a bad idea? 
those those provisions now just become bad law. It's it's a clear example of how of how not to make law. And unfortunately, what all of this does, and and then it's also there's also an introduction of a of a non-reporting of usages a penalty that can cost a company up to 10% of its annual turnover if it doesn't report to each and every actor that pe performed in the film every act of commercialization before that act of commercialization takes place. Now, people, uh, honestly, uh, I think, you know, even though there are other examples, um, you know, once you consider this, and you are you place yourself in the shoes of a foreign investor who's interested in driving a hundred million dollar project to South Africa or to Australia where they don't have those issues. Where do you think it will go? We I think there's a there's a there's a very big misconception that because we've got awesome people in South Africa and because the sun shines all the time, it's even shining on my face now. Um, and we uh, we've got great shooting locations um, and great technical crews. The the projects will just keep coming. And unfortunately, uh, it doesn't work like that because all of the major uh, studios overseas, uh, whether music, uh, whatever content production, animation, software development companies. A feature film, they've got lawyers like me and you sitting there saying, okay, it's your job to advise me on risk. Now, uh, here's 10 countries that I'm interested in shooting in. Uh, I like South Africa also on that list. Okay, so advise me on risk. Those lawyers will simply say, look, at the moment, uh, you're going to have to do X, Y, and Z, and you run risk of, of, of um, you know, if you, of of this turnover penalties and all sorts. You've got to have administration in place. You're going to pay out royalties and you can't own the work for the duration of copyright without after 25 years doing a deal, a new deal with each performer that was featured. And um, and and you can't, you, you actually have to do, do a deal with all of the script writers, all of the musicians and so forth. Um, I, I think it's a bit of a no brainer uh, where people are going to go. And then um, just briefly, because I want to, I want to bring in uh, a very important and interesting point. Um, but just a last, a last comment on the uh, on what people need. Uh, I think investors also need. Um, it, it goes hand in hand with clarity in law, right? They need appropriate enforcement mechanisms. Now, at the moment, we know that um, we, we've uh, the proposal is to bring in. Uh, a sweeping range of copyright exceptions and limitations, including an open-ended fair use uh, system that is not grounded by any uh, counterbalances uh, in, in, from an enforcement perspective. Really a field day for, for, for users of content um, and, and not for rights holders uh, and for creatives. But what that does, we, there was a real missed opportunity, even though stakeholders did lobby for it, uh, for some kind of a mechanism to allow lawyers to actually uh, uh, take action against defendants in foreign jurisdictions that don't own assets in South Africa, something like site blocking, uh, of, of, you know, was 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 something that was put on the table, and it was unfortunately uh, the other way by saying that instead of putting more of, 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 of infringement mechanisms available in the digital space, let's give more leeway for the tech companies. And there's a there's a COVID. Uh, a covert, uh, not covert, covert amendment of the uh, of, through the Copyright Act of ECTA uh, that says all of the exceptions and limitations that are made available in the Copyright Act, the new six pages of exceptions and limitations, will now be uh, available to internet companies and ISPs in addition to the existing safe harbors in ECTA without consulting the Department of uh, uh, Communications uh, by all uh, looks of it. There's a, uh, I see we're right on time, but please log, stay logged in because um, I, I, I do have a special guest star um, who I want to, uh, to explain one of the areas um, that also Im uh, affects implied license terms. Um, and it's, it's actually a point that only, to my knowledge, was picked up by him in his expert advice to the National Assembly. Uh, it's Andre Myberg, who's, uh, who's, a, who's a former colleague of, of all of us, uh, well, if, from the legal community. He's also a former member of, of LES. Uh, um, and Andre, are you still online to, uh, to, to, to take this question and explain um, the implied statutory license terms? Uh, yes, I'm here. Great, Andre. Well, uh, great to have you. Thank you very much uh, for joining us. Uh, and and please tell us more. <laughs> the floor is yours. Um, right, uh, Stephen. Well, thank you for the opportunity. 
Um, I think just one thing you mentioned earlier, you said my device was 250 pages. That was with the annexures. Without the annexures, it was only 121. Um, but the provision that you're referring to is sitting in uh, uh, section 23 or thereabouts, um, which is the provision that deals with um, uh, uh, copyright contracts. Um, it uh, and the formalities relating to assignments and licenses. So you've already mentioned the one about uh, an assignment only having a validity for 25 years. There are other provisions in there as well. Um, there's a new subsection eight that I think uh, everyone on this call would be interested in looking at that introduces by operation of law um, a uh, uh, a right to sub-license. So every license agreement in relation to copyright um, in South Africa would have uh, an implied, uh, statutorily implied um, right to sub-license unless it is excluded. Um, this is the kind of uncertainty that can lead uh, to, to all sorts of um, uh, unexpected uh, consequences um, and it is in itself a, a, a pretty high risk um, uh, uh, topic. Um, <clears throat> there are many provisions in the bill that have not been um, uh, well ventilated. Um, all the attention has been on fair use and the exceptions. Um, but there is something that has recently happened that should draw our attention to one of the very first provisions of the bill. Um, so, so the bill introduces a new section 2A right at the very front. Um, <clears throat> and this relates to uh, so-called computer program interface specifications. Now, this is the subject of massive litigation that has been going on in the United States for about 10 years now. Um, the case of uh, Oracle versus Google, where Oracle accused Google of infringing the copyright in a, in a number of lines of its software code. Um, Google defended on, on a couple of bases, one that, uh, uh, um, that these lines of the software code amounted to an interface specification. It, la it, it related to, to uh, a Java app. I don't want to go into the detail. Um, and uh, that computer programs could not work unless people could freely copy it. Um, so uh, Google based their defense on two grounds. The, the first one is the old uh, idea versus uh, um, uh, copyrightable um, uh, subject matter uh, duality. You know, so an idea is not subject to copyright or can't uh, get copyright protection. And the other one was that uh, its use of those lines of, copy of, of computer code amounted to fair use. Um, this case eventually, after 10 years, ended up being argued before the US Supreme Court literally last week. So the case started in 2010 and last week argument was heard um, in the Supreme Court after the case had gone between the California District Court and the Federal Court of Appeals for a number of years. Um, so we are, everybody is waiting with great anticipation on the outcome here because this is the most significant copyright case the Supreme Court has heard in the past decade. Um, not so in South Africa, I'm afraid, because um, in um, August 2017, um, uh, the copyright, uh, May 2017 rather, the copyright bill was introduced with a clause saying that uh, copyright protections does not subsist in the case of computer programs in interface specifications. Um, so this was really uh, 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 predetermining the outcome of an Oracle versus Google case in South Africa um, so, so that um, uh, a company um, that ha is the owner of software code that is being taken for other purposes 
is now disentitled from bringing um, bringing a case. Oracle versus Google would then never happen in South Africa because um, a, a company like uh, uh, in Oracle's position would not be able to start with the case in the first place, thanks to Section 2A1B, right at the start of the Act. Um, there's no explanation for this. There's nothing about it in the memorandum relating to the bill, uh, nor in the preceding uh, uh, socio-economic impact assessment, which was a, a pretty bare bones document. Um, there's nothing to explain this at all, and it comes across as pretty arbitrary. Um, now, you know, the case could go either way, um, uh, but uh, the point I want to make here is that um, this provision was an arbitrary removal of um, uh, of copyright in in a work that could, in other jurisdictions, qualify for copyright protection, with no explanation, no no impact assessment, nothing. Um, so that is something that one has to take into account. Um, the other provision I want to mention is the very last one, which is Schedule Two to the bill. Um, when I was uh, in the public hearings in um, Cape Town, uh, August 2017, um, it seemed to me, I may be wrong, but it seemed to me that that um, uh, uh, there was a lot of misunderstanding as to what Schedule 2 was all about uh, from everybody, from parliamentarians, DTI officials, stakeholders. Schedule 2 has its origin in the appendix to the Berne Convention. And the appendix to the Berne Convention allows a developing country that um, accedes to it, if one can use that term, um, to benefit from a statutory license that, um, uh, 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 that goes beyond what the Berne Convention allows. So it's a special dispensation to a developing country to make reprints and translations of literary works, published works, that are not available in its country. Um, so, Schedule 2 is based on the Berne Convention appendix, but then it got amended. Um, and it got amended in a way that the Berne Convention doesn't allow. It was uh, changed in certain significant respects that I won't go into. But the most important thing is that Schedule 2 ended up being anchored in um, the provisions relating to uh, the formalities for exclusive licenses, the provisions that we uh, discussed uh, when I started uh, speaking about it. So it actually makes uh, no sense at all, the attachment of Schedule 2 to the formalities for ex exclusive licenses makes absolutely no sense. And it seems to imply that maybe all these Schedule 2 rights should, by operation of law, appear in, a, uh, um, uh, in an exclusive license. Um, uh, uh, the wording ju doesn't justify it, but I don't know what the wording does say. So it is a, a, um, a, a very uh, concerning thing because here we have this massive um, set of provisions uh, floating around with no apparent purpose in the Act, and it's uh, something that one one should be aware of. And yes, I think that's that's me. Thank you so much, Andre, uh, for your comments and, and uh, illuminating that. Um, and to be honest, that you're absolutely right. No one has made sense of that. Um, I think yours uh, your uh, advice was the only that 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 actually dealt with it. Um, uh, the the rest of us were just scratching our heads <laughs> around what uh, why it's there, um, as you say, and and what the implications of it would be. Uh, it it just sort of underscores, and I think this will be my final comment. Thank you again, Andre. Uh, my final comment, um, as I mentioned, you know what we need to drive the uh, uh, the economy through really invigorating the, um, the, the enabling the creative industries to deliver. And the creative industries can deliver because we've actually got tremendous interest from uh, production companies all around the world, uh, not only film and television, uh, but also, uh, you know, software development, animation. We've seen some tremendous successes. 
uh, we've seen our, our local filmmakers um, reach the international stage. I don't know which of you have or have not yet seen uh, the uh, my octopus teacher, uh, you know, from a Cape Town filmmaker that's through Netflix has reached global audiences um, like that. And um, next year, come next year, I'm sure he'll that uh, Cape Town filmmaker will be walking the red carpet um, to to collect an Oscar. And the the power, not only the the power of investment, but also the stories that we have here in Africa, the 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 talent that we have uh, in in all across all fields, music um, uh, uh, and all forms of entertainment, is actually un, uh, potentially unrivaled. And to unleash that, this is the time. This is the time for government to get it right. And I feel in many ways uh, a lot of us have been deflated because it's been such a frustrating process um, because it seems like you sort of make have, a, have some go forward momentum and then it gets driven back. But um, uh, to, to, to finish off, the, uh, the opportunity exists at re-engagement at the provinces. Um, you might ask what happens if there is a U-turn at the portfolio committee or the, national, or the National Assembly doesn't confirm that decision and says, no, we will fix some of the other issues, but we don't think re-tagging is necessary. Then uh, I can assure you that we will see um, we will see the matter in the constitutional court, either through the referral uh, by the president or through um, or through the uh, uh, actual uh, uh, challenge from industry. And um, and finally, I've I've, I've just remembered um, a, a point that I haven't raised, but I should in this conversation uh, about licensing. Um, the bill also contains a provision that allows the minister. Uh, to basically determine compulsory uh, and standard uh, royalty ter uh, sorry terms to be included in all copyright contracts. So the minister, this this brings me back to that first uh, the first of the four pillars for investment is to make sure that investors have clarity in law. And and when the minister can actually at any point in time gazette a notice and say, look, from now on in the music industry or in the film industry, um, uh, because we've been lobbied by a local, uh, uh, you know, let's say a, a local interest group, um, that there's there's fears of exploitation. Government is going to uh, to uh, interfere, and from now on, this is what an industry contract should look like. These kind of provisions will actually, these kind of provisions will actually uh, lead to uh, a situation where investors who, like I mentioned, we're looking at if you want to drive the economy in the right direction, you have to bring in the big projects. And the big projects, the, the lawyers like me and you who act for them in other countries looking at South Africa will simply say, look, this elevates the risk profile. And it's unfortunately not the only thing that elevates it. What else elevates it? All these other factors that I mentioned, the fact that you cannot unify rights uh, with any degree of certainty. Even the new commissioning clause except uh, uh, amendments uh, make the commissioning provision very, very confusing as to when and where the rights uh, will be transferred. And um, and all of this contributes to a situation of uncertainty. And probably the more likely outcome would be that the biggest investors will say, let's let's halt our projects for South Africa uh, just for a couple of years. We need to see what happens uh, when the dust settles. Um, you know, before we actually commit to this. But uh, but if if government gets it right, and uh, I, I'm an eternal optimist. I need each and every one of you who are actually, uh, to to engage your clients and to rally them up and to say let's let's actually uh, focus on the engagements that are coming and and clearly uh, work together in industry to through your relative uh, respective associations etc to clearly articulate to government what the problems are because there will be another I'm confident there will be further. Uh, 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 opportunities for engagement and we must cease it as uh, not only as lawyers uh, not only as business people but as, as south africans um and and people who who have the creative industries at heart so thank you for your time um and uh, I've, if uh, if there are any questions um uh, for me or for andre who also spoke to uh, you're welcome to raise them um now i guess feel free Sorry, the audio is just a little bit faint. Could you would you kindly repeat? There was a question, sorry about that. I'm at the coast. 
There's a question from Carlos. He says, he was also suggested a policy on broadcasting. Is this related to the defective growth? Uh, the policy on broadcasting, are you, are you referring to the white paper that was uh, recently published last week? Carla, can you answer that? Is your question? Okay, so yes, so no, the white paper is not related to the copyright matter, uh, but it is uh, it is equally concerning because it does contain um, you know a number of uh, at this stage it's just a white paper, so there's there's an opportunity of I think eight weeks or so uh, for stakeholders to submit uh, to submit their representations, and for those in the broadcasting space, uh, I do recommend that you um, that you certainly uh, do so, um, and and the lawyers who serve clients in the broadcasting space. Have a very close look at that at, at that white paper because there's there's quite quite um, significant changes that are being proposed to how broadcasting will happen and and quite a lot of restrictions being placed on um, on 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 uh, companies internet uh, streaming services uh, and and so forth that that might also make people think twice before they enter South Africa uh, because they have to get licensed here. There will be local local content quotas, which in itself isn't necessarily necessarily a problem. We see that worldwide, but it has to be done in the right way. So that's unrelated to the copyright bill, but definitely related to the creative industry. So um, so yes, lawyers and and clients engaged in that space have to have to participate in that process. And then I believe we have a question from Carlo. Carlo, uh, please go ahead. I think that was the question from Carlo. Oh, oh sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Carlo, I hope that answered your question. Um, any, anyone else? Well, if you can hear me, uh, uh, Stephen, I would have a second question, and that is the, uh, it's now a time a while ago, but a while back, the, the South African uh, delegation to the World Trade Organization asked a series of questions of how to interpret the famous three-step test, which plays a role in, in patent law and in copyright law. And... Um, we never quite came to the bottom of that, but uh, as as you may know, the, in fact, there is now the race on for a new director general of the WTO. So I just wonder if if you're aware as to where that was coming from and, and, and how that might tie up into this entire discussion. Thank you, Carlo. Um, well, my understanding is also that of that that inquiry i'm not entirely certain but i think that the inquiry was sort of answered in a in a in a roundabout way that it wasn't really the forum for them to decide and and i think it what it came about because the dti was under pressure uh during the us tr investigations that i mentioned uh, the investigations by the office of the united states a trade representative um as to a complaint that they received from stakeholders in the united states which are basically the the largest companies engaged in, in uh, you know, they want to want to invest in South Africa. They want to send projects to South Africa, but their hands will be tied if this bill goes through the way it is. Um, for the reasons I've, I mentioned, uh, they will actually not be able to uh, to 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 actually participate in the market here because the minimum market entry uh, levels for them and the risk levels would be too high. So um, it, it seemed to me from DTI decided, similar to the approach that they adopted before the portfolio committee, to adopt a, a very uh, defensive attitude uh, when questioned on uh, potential deficiencies of the bills. And um, one of the core areas was exactly that, the, the exceptions and limitations, and especially the, the fair use uh, 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 proposal, which isn't even the United States fair use proposal. It's, a, like I mentioned earlier, a Frankenstein monster of sorts between fair use, fair dealing. It doesn't have any of the checks and balances that make the system work somewhat well in the United States. And when I say somewhat well, Andre pointed out litigation uh, on fair use can go on for decades. Um, and, in, and, and in South Africa, in our particular uh, market with, with, with our problems with access to justice, 
uh, with our creatives who are already not able to uh, stand up for themselves and, and go all the way and slug it out with um, with a big uh, company in, in, in court. Um, one of the ways to actually have, have, have one of the big concerns was that this vague, uh, the, the, the way that you develop your limitations and exceptions um, is actually uh, linked to, to the burn three step test. And they've, they've, I think the question that DTI raised to the WTO was to say, um, look, um, you know, they were trying to justify that what they were proposing here in South Africa, even though the Berne Convention says that all exceptions have to relate to special cases and the fair use proposal as it stands in South Africa does not relate to special cases. It's quite vague. We don't have any case law. Our courts can't look at the United States courts, um, etc. So I think they try to get a justification there for what they're trying to push through. And if they got the justification, they would have felt more comfortable in the discussions with U.S. government. And they would have felt more comfortable in answering questions that will uh, come now at the National Assembly and before the provinces. Um, does that answer your question, Carlo? Yes, thank you very much. Thank you for the question, Carlo. I think um, we're out of time, so if there are no more questions, we can uh, wrap up. OK, so thank you, Robin. Uh, I just want to say thank you for uh, for this platform. Thank you for this engagement. I think it's actually a very uh, important uh, platform. I'd encourage uh, the lawyers who are interested to, um, you know, to uh, actually engage further on this, to communicate with myself and, and our colleagues in the space, because What's coming now um, is, is a critical time, uh, like I mentioned, and we need to make sure that our clients are ready. We need to make sure that, uh, that we are ready to constructively uh, work with government and make sure that we, we actually, that the, the legislation that's eventually passed is indeed uh, fit for purpose, fit for trade in the digital space, and, and um, that can actually uh, lay the platform for South Africa, an enabling environment for, for FDI, and that can lay the platform so that South Africa be quite rightly positioned as one of the global preferred destinations for high quality content production. The interest is there, the lawmakers can make it happen, and we need to, to, to do what we can to help in the process. Uh, thank you for, 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 all your t for everyone's time. Thank you, we went a bit over, uh, but by my standards of going over, this has actually been uh, very short uh, going over. So thank you, thank you everybody. Thank you, Robin, and, and uh, goodbye Thanks, from Stephen. a sunny, a very sunny Joburg. <laughs> Keep Thanks, on. Stephen. Um, we will post the recording on the LES website if anyone's in interested. Thank you, Robert. Okay, sure. Thank you, Stephen. Bye bye. Okay. Bye.
Leave. 